This morning, we are, as Bill mentioned earlier, in our last week celebrating Advent together. And the message this morning is called Finding God in His Love, and it's going to be out of 1 John chapter 4. So if you brought your Bible, you can go ahead and find 1 John 4. Um, if you would like one and you don't have one, there's a, a little stand in the back there on the far, all the way in the back by the door. It's got extra Bibles on it. You can grab one. You can feel free to take that home with you if you need one. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, 1 John's really easy to find. It's almost at the end. So if you go all the way to the end and you find Revelation, which is the last book, and you just flip back a few pages, you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So 1st John chapter 4, and we're going to be reading verses 7 to 12. Before we get into that, uh, just I hope everyone is enjoying the holidays so far. It's just a few more days till Christmas, and I have a confession to make, which is I'm actually pretty distracted this morning, because my brain is actually thinking about Christmas and the time I'm going to spend with my kids and my family, and um, so I'm only kind of half here, and, and the other half of my brain, I think, is already starting to just think about things I'm going to do with my kids in the, in the coming week. I'm guessing I'm probably not the only one that's just a, a little bit distracted by the holidays coming up, but... At the same time, I think during this holiday season, there's an urge to draw near to God that, that seems to touch almost everybody. There's those of us who have an ongoing relationship with Jesus, we have a, a, just a sense of God's presence and a sense of awe that often tends to, to, start, to start to tickle around in our hearts. And then I think even for people who don't have a relationship with God. There, you see people showing up at church during the holidays who never go to church. You see people listening to and singing along with songs about Jesus' birth who never sing songs about Jesus the rest of the year. Um, when I was growing up, we had a record player, and I know a lot of you guys have never seen a record player, <laughs> but we had a record player, and we used to play Christmas songs You know, the whole month of December, I loved them. My mom loved them. We, 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 didn't, we didn't believe in Jesus. We didn't do anything religious the rest of the year, but we listened to songs about Jesus at Christmas time. There was a guy named Andy Williams. I don't know who, anybody else remember who Andy Williams? Yeah, oh, I'm so glad. I thought maybe nobody was going to have heard of him because this was an old record when I was a kid. And my mom was convinced that Andy Williams had the best Christmas song singing voice of anyone on the planet. So we listened to Andy Williams over and over and over. He had this green Christmas album that we listened to, you know, kind of on constant repeat through the whole month of December. And a, a lot of the songs were just kind of cute, fun songs about Santa Claus. And then some of them were kind of more serious songs about Jesus. And there was one that just was kind of it was almost haunting, and it kind of caught in my heart. And I, I used to think about it over and over. I didn't know what the guy was really talking about it, but it stuck with me. And it was a song called Little Altar Boy. I don't know if anybody else remembers this song. Uh, I'm going to read you just a couple of the lyrics. It was, Little Altar Boy, I wonder could you pray for me? Little Altar Boy, for I have gone astray. What must I do to be holy like you? Little altar boy, oh, let me hear you pray. Little altar boy, I wonder, could you ask our Lord? Ask him, altar boy, to take my sins away. What must I do to be holy like you? Little altar boy, please let me hear you pray. And, and it goes on, and it's this, uh, knowing nothing about the gospel, and nothing about Jesus, I, I would listen to this song, and I heard this story. Uh, I, I imagined an old man who didn't have people around him who loved him, who hadn't invested his life in things that would cause people to be around him loving him, reaching out for, for something, just wanting to touch love, wanting to touch God in some way or another. And it, and it, it caused me to long in my heart for something like that to have an experience of love, an experience of God. I, I didn't even know what it was about, and yet it, it stuck in my heart. And I want to talk 
this morning just about who is God and, and what does it mean for us to experience him? What does it mean for us to know him? And so we're going to look at, at 1 John 4 in just a second and we're going we're gonna to explore that together. Let me pray for us as we get ready to do that. Lord, we just invite your presence right now in this room. God, would you meet us, Lord, here? Would you fill us? We want to encounter you. We want to know you. And God, I ask that you would cause your light to shine in our lives, that others would, would know and encounter you through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start off by just saying, this one statement, and that's the defining aspect of God's identity is his love. And this is kind of a crazy idea. Every time I think about this, it blows my mind over and over again that God is love. And this is what John says. Starting in verse 7, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I've been thinking about this verse, and thinking about this verse, and thinking about this verse for years on end, and, and I still don't understand it. <laughs> and it still kind of just causes me to, to grapple in my spirit every time I think about it, that, that love is so much who God is and what he's about that John could just make this blanket statement that God is love. Um, and another thing that this tells us as we read it is that if we want to know love, that God is the place where we can find it. Relating to God is going to be our, our way that we can connect with love. And also that if we want to know God, it is by loving that we will be able to know God. If, if we get to know a person, just any person, you want to know them well, really know them deeply, we, we need to know what it is that they're passionate about, right? If you have a good friend, think about somebody that you're really close to, a, a, a spouse or parent or, or friend who's really, really special to you, that you know deeply. Right? Who they are can be often summed up in terms of just what, what are their passions? What do, they, what do they get excited about? What makes them sad? What makes them cry? What are the things that touch them deeply? What are their passions? And we get to find out what people's passions are by doing stuff with them, by spending time together doing the things that they do with them. If you really want to know someone, just spend time with them. Follow them around all day and just do the things that they do. And do it with them. And in that way, we, we get to know people. And it turns out that what God is passionate about is people. God is passionate about love. And what God does is love people. And if we, if we spend any time hanging out with Jesus, we've, we'll find out that pretty much all he does is love people just continually. This is who he is and, and what he does. So uh, a second kind of blanket statement for the morning is to know God is to love with him. Right. Again, this is what it says here. Whoever, whoever, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So when we love one another, we know God. And so if we want to know God, we spend time loving together with him. Um, and as we do things together with him, we become like him. Have you ever noticed how people who've been married for a long, long time, sometimes they start to even just look like each other? And you think, you know, they're not related, right? They're not, you know, you know, but there's not, there's not usually shared biological, you know, genetic material. Right? But people, they start to look like each other. They've got like the same kind of posture and they just seem to become more and more like one another over, over the years. Anybody else ever notice that? 
You think, yeah, especially some you know, older couples who are deeply in love, and you think, oh my good, what? Yeah. <laughs> I had a, a really funny experience at my daughter's school the other day. I was, I, I went up just for a kind of presentation of learning that they do at the end of their semester, and I was talking to one of my daughter's friends, and she said, how was your trip to Costa Rica? Because Jamie and I just took a, a trip to Costa Rica. We're, we're celebrating our, it's a trip he's been planning for years, it's to, cel to celebrate our 20th anniversary, and and yeah. she's like, how was Costa Rica? And um, she said, Rose was telling me all the things that you were doing. And I laughed and I said, yeah. And Rose was saying, uh, my parents are having adventures without me. <laughs> and she stopped and her mouth hung open and she said, that's exactly what Rose said. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's because we spend so much time together, right? Because it, I didn't know that was exactly what Rose said, but it, spending time with her, I know what she would say. And what she would say is informed by what she hears me saying, and what I say is informed by what she says. And so f family members living in the house together, you, you start to talk like each other. I've been thinking how many times Jamie and I have uh, opened our mouths and said the exact same thing at the exact same moment, and then laughed at one another, right? But so if we spend time with God, doing the things that God does, loving with him, then we become more and more like him. We start to look like him. We start to walk like him. We start to talk like him. We start to say the things that, that he would say without even, without even planning to. And so if that's all true, then the best way to invest in drawing near to God is loving people. And I'm going to look a little bit more just at this passage and pull out some thoughts on what does it look like to love people the way that God loves people. 1 John 4 goes on to say this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Oh. First thing I think that we can learn about God's love looking at this is that God's love is vulnerable. Uh -huh. God sent his only son into the world in order for us to live through him naked and defenseless. And here's... Here's Jesus, king of the universe, born as a, a tiny, defenseless human baby. He can't do anything for himself. He's the, he's the God of the universe. I mean, he puts himself in a situation where he can't even feed himself or change himself. He soils himself, and he, and he can't clean up after it. He's entirely dependent on human beings just to care for him and Sure, Mary and Joseph tried their best, but I'm sure they weren't perfect because human parents are never perfect. And yet he put himself in, in this vulnerable situation where, where he had to depend on them for everything, where he gets wet and cold and, and hurt. Um, and, and he didn't come with the knowledge that it was all going to be okay because human beings were such great people and we were all going to take such good care of him and love him back, right? He, he came to a world that, that didn't recognize him, to, to a, a land ruled by a king who tried to kill him as soon as he was born. He came and got rejected and ultimately killed on a cross. You know, it wasn't because we were going to understand, because we were going to love him back, right? it hurts to love somebody who doesn't love you back. And not just in a romantic relationship. I think often our minds first go to romantic relationships when we think of somebody loving somebody who doesn't love us back. But a lot of times this happens in just friendships, family relationships. It happens to parents when their children are estranged. And that your heart longs for your child. And it seems like your heart's child doesn't long back for you. Even with the best of relationships with our kids, 
children are, your children are never going to love you the way that you love them. There's just something in a parent's heart that, that's beyond what, what gets given back. Um, I had one situation with a, a, bo- a, a superior in a work relationship where there was a conflict, and I w- wanted to repair the conflict so bad. And I remember talking to the guy and just saying, hey, let's talk this out. Let, let's figure this out together. You know, I, I, I forgive you. Will you forgive me? And, and, and we could start this thing over. And the guy was just like, nah, I, I'm not interested. I'm like, what do you mean you're not interested? I don't want to have a broken relationship with you. I want to have a healed and a whole relationship with you. And, and he was just like, you know, it's just not important to me. And, and it, it hurts, right? And, and this is the way, this is the way that God loves us. This is the way that Jesus came to love us. It's a vulnerable, exposed love. It's a risky love that, that chance is getting hurt. Uh-huh. I have had an incredible weekend so far. Uh, one of the most incredible moments of my weekend was going on Friday night to a celebration at Bridge of Hope. Uh, a number of people from here at Coast were, were down there. And uh, if you're not familiar with Coast, Bridge of Hope is an organization run by Bruin Sherry Briggs who go to this church, they're not here right now, um, that works with families in transition. And they give away food, they give away furniture, household items, and they basically just provide a warm, safe place to come and to, to be loved and to be cared for and to know about Jesus. And they had a big celebration. They just moved into a new building and had a big Christmas celebration on Friday night and a bunch of us went down there and the nations were there. I mean, it was incredible. Just refugee families from all over the place. Uh, Some of the people I met were from Somalia. Other people that I met were from Myanmar. And we had, and there were just families from the neighborhood that that are in need, that have been there for a long time. And it was just, it was an incredible place to be and so fun to see people just full of warmth and celebration. It made me so, uh, so proud of Brew and Sherry and also just so proud of, you know, our congregation, all the people that have been involved in participating in that down there. And one thing that's happening, uh, the, one of the very last thing that I did before I went home was go upstairs to see there's an upstairs apartment. And two people from our congregation are moving into that upstairs apartment. Uh, Kendra and Chelsea, if you know them, are they just moved in. And, and they're going to live in the neighborhood so they can be with the people. And, and it's, it's exciting. But it's a vulnerable love. This is, it's a vulnerable love like Jesus when he came to us. It, this is one of the highest crime rate areas in all of San Diego. Um, and they're not moving in there because it's going to be safe, because they know that they're, that they're in, a, in a completely safe environment, right? But they're going in there because they love the people of the community, and they know that the best way to love them is to go and to be with them, in the same way that Jesus knew it wasn't safe to come here, but if he wanted to love people, he was going to have to come and be with us. This is the kind of vulnerable love that is an imitation of Christ. There's people in our congregation are doing it, and I'm, I'm so excited for that. But let's love vulnerably as we walk into these holidays. And some, sometimes that's radical. Sometimes that's moving into a new, envir- a new neighborhood to be with the people that you care about. And sometimes that's just taking a risk, loving family members who might not really love you back in the way that you'd most like to be loved back. But let's love like Jesus and be vulnerable in that way. Uh, A second thing I think we notice about the love of God when we read this passage is it's proactive. This is love not that we loved God, but that he loved us. God took the first step in this relationship with us. And that's kind of backwards because we're the ones who screwed the whole thing up in the first place. I mean, we're the ones who, who have 
disrespected God, chosen not to follow him. We've disrespected his image and all the people around us. We've continued to disrespect the people that he loves more than anything else in the universe. And we treat each other how we treat each other. I mean, we're the ones who have just walked out on this relationship with him and messed it up over and over again. It's, it's on us, right? It's our responsibility to go and say, hey, God, I'm sorry. I'm really not doing this relationship well, and I, I want to just beg you for your forgiveness and ask if we, could, if, if we could start over somehow or another. But God didn't wait for that. God went first anyway. Even though it was on us to go first, God went first. And Jesus came here to the earth to be with us and to make that first step. Hey, I'd like to have a healed relationship with you. Do, do you want to have a relationship with me? So God's love is, is proactive. God goes first. And so if we're going to love in the way that God loves us, then we're proactive. We go first. We take the risk. I, I want to tell you a uh, a story of one of my first encounters with Christians ever that I can remember. Um, it was a holiday road trip when I was really small, and I actually didn't remember that it was a holiday road trip. I had this memory sticking around in my mind, uh, and I asked my mom about it a few years ago because I couldn't figure, I couldn't place it. It's like, Mom, I have this memory from when I was a child of this place that we went to, and there were these long-haired, hippie-looking people with guitars, and they were singing songs, and we were hanging out with them and singing, and there were donuts. <laughs> and, you know, where was this? I don't remember. I don't think, I don't remember us knowing long-haired, hippie-looking people with guitars or singing songs like that. You know, what was, what was that all about? And my mom said, Oh, I'm pretty sure I do know where that was, but I can't believe you remember that because you were so tiny. Like you, you must have been barely three years old. But we were on a holiday road trip. We went to visit family and friends in Kansas and Missouri, and there was a terrible snowstorm. I mean, it snowed and snowed and snowed. It snowed like I have never seen. And my dad couldn't see to drive the car, and the the road was actually just piling up with snow to the point where it was pretty much impossible to drive, even if you could see. And we ended up just stranded on the side of the highway in, in a mounding pile of snow. And uh, a local church opened up its doors to stranded travelers. Turned out there were, there were cars up and down that whole highway of people who were just trapped in the snow and cold and had no place to go. And a local church opened up its doors and they brought out cots and sleeping bags and blankets and took everybody in. And we spent the night in a church that night and in the morning they gave us donuts. And <laughs> <laughs> but I think just such a tiny, tiny, simple little act of love, just some local Christians in a, in a small town thinking, oh, hey, here's some people in need and an opportunity for us to love them. And they just jumped on it. And I'm, I'm guessing it was easy. I'm guessing it was fun. But they just, they jumped on this little opportunity just to love people they've never met before that they're never going to see again. Total strangers. And yet something about it stuck in the mind of a small child for the rest of her life. My whole life I thought about that. Who are those people? And would it be possible to ever to go back to that place and to, to feel like that again? What was that? Amazing. How much of a difference just a little proactive act of love can be. The last thing is God's love is sacrificial. Um, wasn't that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Um, Jesus moved here, and 
and it was risky and it wasn't easy and it, it wasn't just that it turned the world turned out to be a dangerous it wasn't just that the world was a dangerous place the world was a place where where he got hurt beaten rejected and ultimately killed it was it was a sacrificial act he gave himself for us but and it wasn't even just the moment on the cross that was a sacrifice it was it was a human life lived out as a gift to us he gave his life for ours in so so many ways and so god's love is sacrificial it gives it's a self-giving kind of a love now we don't have to always lose something in order to do real love. A lot of times, Christ-like love doesn't involve losing something. A lot of times it's a win-win. But Christ-like love doesn't, it doesn't shrink back from the times when love costs something. I, I wanna tell you about the, the second really awesome party I had a chance to go to this weekend. So I went to two really awesome parties. The first one was at Bridge of Hope on Friday night. And then last night, we went to just an amazing party put on by our Love 146 task force for girls and women coming out of trafficking who, who've been trafficked in, in our city. Yes, it does happen in our city, and there's some safe homes in our city for those people. And um, the, our Love 146 task force has a relationship with a safe home, and they've been throwing an annual Christmas party for the girls and women that, that stay there. And Jamie and I had a chance to go. And I think just one note as I, I felt filled up with, with just joy and so proud of our congregation, just the same way that I did when I went to the Bridge of Hope party. Um, so just thanks so much to Kelly and Rob are sitting in the back. Um, Kelly and Esther run our Love 146 task force and, and their husbands, Rob and Patrick, both were also there and involved and helped put it on and just, a uh, fantastic and a beautiful night and so just wonderful to get to know these women whose lives are being transformed and to, to spend time with them. And I had this, that same just sense of just swelling in my heart of just, wow, oh, people in our congregation are doing, are doing good things. God's love is being made manifest in the world. Um, and the most fascinating part of the evening to me was talking to the nuns who run the home and realizing that these women have given their whole lives to this. Their whole lives. You know, I'm gonna go to a party and then I'm gonna go home and spend time with my husband and with my kids. And yet, you know, th these women, are, they're, they're not going home, that's where they live. And, and this has been their whole life. They're just, they're pouring out everything that they are into just caring for, for these women and for these girls. And, and it's amazing, it's a sacrificial love. It's a love that gives of themselves. Huh? So I just wanna ask us, what are the ways in which God is calling us to love like him huh? during the holidays that are coming up? John, First uh, John 4 ends like this. Well, it doesn't end like this. The part we're going to read this morning ends like this. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Uh -huh. So if we want to see God, let's love one another and see God's love made complete in us. Uh, and so this Christmas, just as we're getting ready for the holidays and people are celebrating this week, and some of us will be with friends, some of us will be with family, some of us are gonna be lonely, some of us are gonna be joyful wherever we find ourselves. Let's practice drawing near to God. Practice drawing near to God by loving the way that he loves. And let's all ask ourselves, just as we go through the week, just be aware of what God's doing. God, who are you calling me to love? What are the ways in which you're calling me to draw near to you by 
being like you in love. And a question, just if there's anybody here this morning who this is all kind of new stuff. Um, this, this whole idea of a God who, who is love and in everything that he is and everything that he does is something you, you haven't heard of before. And you don't, you don't know him personally in the way that most of us who are here this morning know him. Uh, we would love for you just to know God the way that we do. We would love to just invite you into that because it's been a blessing and a joy in our lives. Um, so we're going to close our service with uh, one more song. And then after that, we're going to take a time to, to pray for each other. And I want to invite you, you know, if you... If this is new and you want this, then come up during our, our prayer time at the end. And let us know. I would like to know a God who's like this. and We would love to share about him and to pray for you. Um, let's stand and pray together. Well, Lord, we are just in awe of your love. In awe of the God who loved us first. In awe of a God whose heart is wide open. And God, I just want to say yes to you and to your love once again. And God, would you help us to walk in it? Help us to invest in knowing you by spending time loving people together with you this week. Would you be near to us? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, let's worship together. Um, I wanted to share a story from Thanksgiving. Um, went into Thanksgiving with the conviction that needed to pray for some sick family members. So I just wanted to share one story. Um, I was talking to Amy's grandfather, um, and he was telling me about how he had been having some pretty bad earaches, um, maybe an ear infection or something. He had some medication that he was taking to kind of calm that down. And uh, the day we talked to him on Thanksgiving, um, he had said that his prescription was about to run out, and the um, CVS or wherever he gets his pres prescription wasn't going to be able to fulfill that for a while. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, can I pray for you? Our church has been praying for healing and seeing some pretty cool results. Um, so he, he said yes. Um, I prayed for him, and that was pretty much it. Um, and I got a chance to talk to him. I saw him um, earlier this month, and when I asked him about it, he said that he had gotten a prescription again but hadn't used it. Um, and his, his ear had been fine still. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and just a word of encouragement for you guys in this season is to do the same. Um, I'm sure we all have someone we know that's hurting, that has some sort of need for a healing in their body. And I think God really wants to use us to do that this, this Christmas. Um, so a few things that we felt during ministry time. One is to really... Um, if, you, if you do find that you have a family member that is in need of physical healing, pray for them. Um, felt like the Lord wanted to specifically anoint people today um, to pray for healing for their family. Um, so if that's you, please come up. We'll have a team up here to pray for you, to bless you, to impart healing to your sick family members. Um, and the other one that we really felt was that we would walk in authenticity this Christmas. If we are, if, if you happen to be a part of a family that isn't necessarily um, a family that follows Jesus, that you would um, stand firm in your convictions, that you would stand firm in your relationship with Jesus and represent him well, that you would walk with him well, um, and that you would bring him with you into that season, into your family. Um, so if that applies to you too, we'd love to pray for you. Um, so I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. If any of those things resonate with you, um, please come up. Um, I'd also love to pray for you if you um, feel like any of those um, mean something to you. Um, and so I'm going to close us today 
Um, let's close by holding hands across the aisle, as we always do. And we do this as a sign of uh, just being a part of a church family. Yeah. Well, Lord, we just uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the gift of your son. And we just say happy birthday this season. God, thank you for... Thank you for your son who you gave to us this, uh, this season. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, walk with us as we go into this Christmas holiday, uh, that we would uh, experience your love and that we would pass on an experience with your love. Uh, Lord, that you would use us to heal the sick and to bring people into your kingdom. Um, to share the good news that you came for us and that you love us. So just bless everyone here to do that and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.